Work on the span. Welcome to our Shout Smithsonian online conference. We're coming to you live today from uh, Barro, Colorado Island here in Panama. And we're going to go ahead and give you a view of, uh, of where we are. We're on the balcony here at the Stry Laboratories. And we're going to hear more about what goes on here and what we're looking at and why this area is so important. You just heard a welcome message from Tony Coates, who will be joining us live in just about an hour after our first session. And we couldn't be more excited to have all of you joining us today. As you can tell, we're looking at the water. And that is the theme for our conference here for Shout during year two of this fantastic program, which is all about exploring, connecting, and acting as we learn about the environment around us. In just a moment, we're going to introduce <coughs> Andrew Altieri, who is sitting right here next to me. Uh, and he is going to be our first presenter here live from Panama here on Barro, Colorado Island. But before we do, I wanted to just make sure you were all very comfortable with how to interact with all of us. And so on your screen right now, just below my picture and the picture of Andrew, is a box that says Q&A. And we'd love for you to use the area underneath that box to send in your questions and your comments as we go along. Good morning to our friends joining us from Bloomington, Indiana. Good to see you there as well, uh, as so many other people who are joining us. So do use the chat area and let us know a little bit about why you're joining us, what your interest is in, in the SHOUT conference, and perhaps in the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Hello to our colleagues from Washington, DC, who we see logged in here with us today. Um, wanted to take just a quick moment to give you a sense to, as to how the day and the next two days will unfold. Uh, we're going to start our talk, as I mentioned, with Andrew talking about hypoxia in marine systems, um, also known as the dead zone. We're going to find out whether a dead zones really are dead. And uh, then we will turn our attention to Tony, whose voice you heard a few moments ago, uh, and to Sharon Ryan, as well as a special guest joining us, uh, Dave Pearson from Arizona, who are going to be talking about from desert to rainforest. And we'll be doing literally just that, going from the rainforest to the desert and back again. So please uh, do check that out and join us. And then we'll wrap up the day with two additional sessions, one that makes a complete 90 degree turn or 180 degree turn, depending on how you think of it. And we'll be looking at art and how it depicts nature, and in particular, how art can serve as a tool to understand science, history, and perhaps more. So we'll be joined by Susanna and Sally from that, from the Smithsonian Art Museum in Washington. And then we'll turn to Tricia Edwards, who is an education specialist at the Lemelson Center at the National Museum of American History. And she's going to be talking about how inventors and innovators are working to improve access to clean water globally. And uh, what a great way that will be to end the day. Don't forget, we have a complete day two planned. And we'll be live from Panama again tomorrow, as well as uh, being joined by folks from, uh, from uh, other parts of the Smithsonian. And they'll be with us on part two. We'll give you a little bit of a recap on that. Thanks to everyone who's been giving us their greetings from Trenton to Indianapolis to uh, Washington and Pakistan and beyond. So it's good to have all of you with us. We're going to go ahead and quickly thank our partners, of course, uh, the Smithsonian, <coughs> our wonderful hosts uh, here at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And uh, special thanks to our partners, Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global for making this event possible. So we're going to go ahead now and uh, turn our attention uh, to Andrew Altieri, uh, who is an ecologist here uh, as part of the, in Panama. Uh, as part of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. He does some amazing work, and he's going to tell us about some of it live here online today. So we're live, but we're going to talk about the dead zone. Andrew, thanks so much for coming over to the island this morning to join us. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for having me here. It's a great opportunity to share some of what I know with uh, you and the others out there in our broader global audience. Excellent. And by the way, as people go along, I want to encourage them to ask you questions. And so I'll interrupt from time to time and share those questions with you. Uh, so don't be alarmed. And please, everyone online, do jump in and, and make this a, a dialogue with all of us. Yeah, this is a great forum for an interactive discussion. So I hope we get some good questions today. Great. Okay. So um, until the questions start rolling in, I'll just start off with a discussion or uh, just a quick overview of sort of what I'm interested in studying and why I think it's important. Oh. Before we um, jump ahead too far, though, I just want to quickly define um, for you what hypoxia is and um, why it's so relevant to um, all of us, whether we live near the coast or not. 
Um, and I'll just start off by just describing briefly the importance of marine ecosystems. Um, marine ecosystems are disproportionately uh, important um, to human society in that um, greater than 40% uh, of the world's populations live within about 100 kilometers of the coast. And um, throughout our history, we've been drawn to the coastal environment because it provides such valuable resources. We gain clean water, we gain uh, food, fuel, um, and more recently, we've come to appreciate the aesthetic value that um, coastal environments offer. And, um, and there's a way of quantifying this. And when e economists and ecologists have done so, what they found is that even though the coastal environment uh, covers only about 5% of the Earth's surface, it actually represents over 40% of nature's value, um, whether we assign a dollar value to that or just a relative, um, a relative value. And so we've come to realize that coastal environments are very important. And I've been drawn to studying uh, coastal ecosystems um, because I myself have appreciated this value. And I've um, dedicated myself to understanding um, all the ways in which humans interact with the environment um, along the, um, the coast with the ocean, um, why they're so important, and how it is that humans can help um, preserve um, existing value and perhaps even um, reverse the clock in areas where there's been some degradation. And so that's been sort of my, vote, my motivation for um, studying these marine environments. And um, dead zones in particular have attracted my attention because it's becoming obvious that they're um, having a very large impact um, on the value of coastal ecosystems, um, on the, what we call the ecosystem services that they provide. These are the values that we attribute to it, including, as I mentioned before, fresh, clean water, um, um, buffering from storm damage, and uh, food and fuel. And so um, <clears throat> I'll just quickly now move on to um, a simple definition of dead zones. This is sort of a, dead zones are just a easy to understand um, name that's been given to areas along the coast where the oxygen levels have dropped. And this can happen naturally, <clears throat> um, but most often now we're realizing that it's being made worse by human activities. And um, I'll describe just, <clears throat> just in what way with a diagram in a moment. But again, it's important to realize or remember that um, most of the marine life that we're familiar with, including um, fish, clams, um, sea stars, um, all those animals require oxygen um, to persist. And so when the, ox the dissolved oxygen levels in the water um, decline, it puts all that marine life at risk. And I think many of us are familiar with the fact that if you have an aquarium at home, one of the most important things is to keep um, the filter and the bubbler running, because if you don't have um, that aeration happening, then you quickly, the, the fish and the animals in the aquarium will deplete the oxygen from the water and um, they'll go belly up. And so the same is true in coastal areas. We need to have oxygenated water um, to sustain the marine life that um, we're so dependent on and that we value along the coast. So um, I'll start off with a, um, next with a couple of diagrams that just describe how it is that um, humans are um, increasing the prevalence of these low oxygen or hypoxic areas um, along the coast. So um, it's, uh, there's a couple steps in the process, which is why we have two diagrams. And the first is to think about the inputs uh, mm -hmm. that humans um, are introducing into the coastal environment. Um, and in particular, the nutrients that we introduce. And uh, nutrients are entering into coastal waters um, through a number of ways, one of which is um, agriculture and livestock runoff. So the waste from animal farms, particularly hog farms, for example, in the south southeastern United States, um, excess fertilizer that runs off through the Mississippi uh, Basin and out through the river into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, those are forms of nutrients that are introduced um, at large scales into the, into the coast um, within the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. And then there's other forms of uh, runoff and nutrient introductions, such as from uh, residential runoff, small scale uh, septic tanks and leach fields. Um, there's also urban runoff and sewage treatment plants. And so many of us are familiar with the fact that the water that goes through, um, that leaves our house through the drain, um, enters into sewage treatment plants. But in many cases, the nutrients are not removed, excess nitrogen and phosphorus. And so those, um, those uh, nutrients enter into the water. And um, there they act as fertilizer for um, phytoplankton and algae that lives um, in, the, in the coastal environment. So they can be the mi microscopic phytoplankton as well as the macroalgae or seaweeds that we see along the coast. 
So all, those, all that plant life benefits from the fertilizer that we're introducing, um, which you may think is a good thing, except that when the algae um, decomposes, and I've moved to the next uh, diagram, whether it's the phytoplankton or the macroalgae, um, we, have a, we fertilize these large blooms from the excess nutrients, and when those um, phytoplankton and algae sink to the bottom, they're decomposed by bacteria, and those bacteria, as they multiply and consume that phytoplankton and algae, consume oxygen. And that process of, um, you know, through their own microbial life. And so when they consume the oxygen, it depletes the oxygen from the bottom waters. And if that can't be replenished from uh, the surface, then that's when we have a, um, a hypoxic area or a dead zone. And in that diagram, you see how the water is essentially layered. You have fresher or less dense water on the surface that acts as a cap that seals in the low oxygen water near the bottom and prevents replenishment of the bottom water from the, um, from the atmosphere. So, Andrew, quick question yeah, sure. uh, that, uh, that arises when you're talking about this. At that point in the cycle when um, the amount of oxygen um, is depleted, does it also have uh, a negative effect on the phytoplankton that were depleting it? Do they too, um, do they continue to increase or do they too um, begin to die off at that point? So there's a couple of things. That's a great question. So there's two things that are happening. One is that you can have phytoplankton up near the surface continuing to proliferate, and um, it's only when it dies and sinks to the bottom that you have oxygen being consumed. So you can have the phytoplankton continuing um, to prosper near the surface, and yet the microbial activity and the decomposition happening near the bottom. Um, there's also seaweeds along the bottom of these coastal areas, and um, it could um, um, be impacted by hypoxic conditions. So one thing that's important to remember is that uh, algae produces oxygen during the day when it's photosynthesizing, but at night it becomes a consumer of oxygen itself to continue its uh, respiration. And so the um, algae near the bottom um, plays um, two different roles depending on whether it's day or night. And at night it can um, be contributing to the problem and, um, and be effective as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a bit of background. And, and it's important to think about this because, again, um, this is a way in which humans uh, or people, whether they're living, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of kilometers from the coast, can be impacting the coastal environment because a lot of the nutrients that enter into these coastal areas are originating um, well inland on, on farms, for example, where there's excess nutrients being introduced or, um, or from uh, sewage treatment plants. Um, and another thing to think about is just the fact that these oxygen levels typically drop and are lowest um, near the bottom. And so, um, they're out of sight from the casual observer. And so it's only when we've uh, gone in uh, to the bottom waters with specialized instruments oftentimes that we've just detected how severe and how extensive this problem is. Um, there can be some signs um, near the surface or evident from shore, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a moment. Um, but that's just uh, something to keep in mind, that this is something of an insidious threat. It's a, it's a major problem. It's very widespread. But because it's largely out of view from the surface, it's been um, largely unappreciated until very recently. And now that we've gone out and taken a closer look, um, and this is a, a study that was published by uh, Diaz and Rosenberg just a few years ago, where they went out and they just put on a map all the known locations of hypoxic areas. We realize that it's um, very extensive. Hundreds of sites around the world are now known to go hypoxic um, along, the, along the coast, particularly in developed areas of North America and Europe. And um, there's a couple things to note here. One is that in, in just the past 10, 15 years, the number of known hypoxic areas has more than doubled. So we realize that it's, a, it's, an, it's a increasingly severe at an accelerating rate. And the other thing to note is that um, most of the known hypoxic areas are in temperate areas. So these are areas that are midway between the equator and the poles. And um, I would suggest that's largely an artifact of, um, of where most of the scientists have been doing their work. And um, I'll bring up an antidote near the end of uh, the, our discussion here where um, that'll suggest that hypoxia could be much more prevalent and extensive within tropical ecosystems as well. Um, and it's just that they haven't been explored there yet. Incidentally, we, we asked our online participants if they were aware of any bodies of water that um, had hypoxic conditions near them. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are still registering their votes, but uh, it's essentially um, three to one right now. Uh, people who are not aware, either are not aware of or don't know of, um, or there aren't any hypoxic conditions near them. But looking at this map, it's um, if you're near a, a coastal waters, uh, 
um, you might very well be near a hypoxic um, yeah, body that's right. There. And I think that um, there's a couple of things. One is, as I mentioned before, the problems are oftentimes out of sight. So only occasionally do they make headlines. Um, but I'll share examples of some of those in, in just a few moments. And then the other issue, too, is I think people take it for granted that the harbor or the bay near their house is largely devoid of life. That's known it's not a great area to go fishing or to swim because it's, it's heavily polluted. And people, I think, sometimes forget that it, it wasn't necessarily like that throughout time, but maybe just for mm -hmm. a few generations. And so um, um, in some cases, those hypoxic areas just aren't in the headlines anymore because it's just assumed to, to, um, to always be, have always been that way, even though that's not the case. So um, we'll move on now with one case that did um, make um, headlines, and that was a hypoxic event. This was actually a few decades ago now along the New Jersey coast. Um, but it was one of the few instances where people were able to put um, a price tag on one of these events. Um, and in today's dollars, it was roughly $2 billion in damages. Oxygen levels dropped off the coast of New Jersey, and as a consequence, there was a decline in, um, in a harvest of fish, uh, lobsters, uh, fin fish. A lot of uh, dive trips, and particularly fishing charters, were, were essentially grounded during this time because there was nothing to catch. And so um, there was uh, some uh, ecologists and economists that went out from NOAA, and they just put a price tag on that, and they realized that there was a very severe impact. And um, <clears throat> I think that many of us can appreciate um, the significance of losing uh, marine life and having a dead zone right off the coast. Um, but sometimes it helps to put a dollar sign on one of these events because that's, that, that puts things in a language that, um, that um, politicians, that developers, that economists, that um, people from all walks of life generally understand is the value of a dollar. And, uh, and now I'm just showing you a picture um, on, in the presentation of some dead fish that floated to the surface in an area where I've done uh, my research. You see those are baby menhaden, which are an important fish because they're used for food, particularly for livestock, um, feed for aquaculture, um, and uh, as fertilizer. Um, and they're also a um, great indicator of some problems that Narragansett Bay, where I've done some of my research, um, um, has experienced. And so, um, at any rate, this is a, a, the question that's motivated much of my research over the past few years, and that is, how does marine life respond to hypoxia? So a lot of the research on hypoxia has been conducted by oceanographers that are interested in understanding where hypoxia occurs and why. Um, and I'm really interested in understanding what the consequences are for living marine systems. And to understand um, uh, what those consequences are requires going out into nature and really quantifying um, just what's happening. So um, one of my study sites has been Narragansett Bay, which is uh, an estuary in Rhode Island. It's a great example of one of these temperate estuaries with a, a dense uh, population on its coast. So it's a great living laboratory to have conducted some, um, some basic research on uh, how hypoxia is affecting uh, marine life. And it's important to, it's a great study system because it has a dense population along its shorelines. Narragansett Bay drains um, Providence, Rhode Island. And when we think about the watershed or the area of land that drains into the bay, we realize that it's one of the 10 most densely populated watersheds in the U.S. So there's a lot of people um, along its shorelines introducing uh, nutrients into the system. And not surprisingly, it does occasionally go um, hypoxic. So here's a, a map showing just where it's located. Um, within uh, New England, within the northeastern United States. And you can see um, uh, a map of the bay. The land's in gray and the water is in blue. And um, Providence is all along the shorelines. That arrow is actually pointing towards Warwick, which is a suburb of, uh, of Providence. Providence is actually the northern tip of that estuary. And um, again, um, it, having that large population um, on the coast with limited exchange of the open ocean through those channels um, at the southern part of the bay, or near the, um, near the bottom of that map, really magnifies um, uh, the, um, the effects of humans in a marine ecosystem. Okay, so here I'm just going to, um, I, I want to present some pictures of um, field work to just remind us um, what it takes to go out and study uh, the marine environment. Pictures of uh, uh, one of my students there. Oh. Um, on the top, that's uh, Emily Lindsay. She was a student who was working with me. Um, that's top side between dives. And the picture below that's a little dark, but that's a picture of uh, me conducting a survey counting um, predators and the densities of uh, mussels 
on the bottom of the bay. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of great pictures from uh, working underwater in Narragansett Bay because like a lot of temperate estuaries, it's very turbid. There's a lot of phytoplankton in the water. Um, we've talked about how nutrients are triggering those blooms. Um, but I will show you some video of what life looked like um, in the bay before uh, hypoxia or this low oxygen event struck the system. Um, and before I do that, I just want to show you um, what some of these instruments look like that we use to measure oxygen. I mentioned that um, you know, these hypoxia events occur largely underwater. It's very uh, difficult to quantify a lack of oxygen directly. You need a specialized instrument, and that limits um, the ability of scientists to go out and quantify how widespread these areas are um, because it takes a specialized piece of equipment that requires a lot of care to do so. Um, at any rate, this is what one of the instruments looks like, and it's able to measure several parameters or different water quality factors um, at a time. One of them is dissolved oxygen. It can also measure salinity, temperature, pH, among other variables. I mean, that's important so that we can tease apart the relative importance of uh, oxygen from those other factors that commonly limit uh, marine life in these systems. <clears throat> so here's um, what the shoreline looked like when I first started to work in Narragansett Bay. And what you see is the shoreline is covered with mussels. There's a panoramic view. Um, in the larger picture um, on this uh, on the on the screen right now, and you can see a small white square that's about half a meter by half a meter in size to give you a sense uh, for scale. And that cobble beach is covered with blue mussels. That's the edible mussel, Middleus edulis. You might be familiar with. If you haven't been to the shoreline, sometimes it shows up on your dinner plate at an Italian restaurant. And those mussels are covering the shoreline. They're ankle deep. You have tens of thousands per meter squared. So dense, dense coverage of these mussels. And you can see a magnified view of one of these mussel beds in the um, upper left-hand corner. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. This uh, bed or reef of mussels extends well offshore and covers an area uh, equivalent to dozens of, of football fields. And what I'll show you um, now, or sorry, in just a moment, is um, what it looks like underwater. Um, but first, I just want to um, describe for you the value of mussels. So we talked about how uh, coastal ecosystems are very valuable to people. And mussels are a great example of um, just how we gain value from a marine life. So mussels are an important food resource. So in addition to people eating mussels, a lot of marine life eats uh, mussels. Um, they're relatively vulnerable to predators. So crabs, sea stars, fish all love to eat mussels. Um, it's an important for sustaining their populations. Um, for smaller organisms, uh, the mussels also form living reefs. So they're a complex habitat, and there's many animals, such as um, baby sea stars and crabs, um, even small fish, uh, shrimp, lots of animals that live in and among the mussels. So within the temperate region, shellfish beds formed by mussels or even oysters are essentially the coral reefs of, of these bays and estuaries. They form the living habitat that sustains uh, much of the marine life. And another way that mussels are so valuable is that they filter the bay's water. So each of these mussels is filtering um, a liter or two of water per an hour when they're really pumping, and they can filter out phytoplankton and help control the phytoplankton blooms when their populations um, are, are, um, are healthy. Um, but they basically act as, um, as filters, just as you have filters in a swimming pool to remove excess um, algae or nutrients. These mussels can, um, can do the same function up to a point um, when, they're, when they're healthy. So there's several of the ways in which mussels are a valuable um, resource. And now we have um, a video, it's about 30 second clip, of what these mussel beds look like underwater before hypoxia hit. And this is just to emphasize the amount of marine life that was associated um, with these mussel beds um, in this estuary. And Stars, fish, and crabs associated with the mussel bed. So really, you just see a cornucopia of the life associated with these beds. And you see how the bed forms this complex habitat that's used by all these animals. So you see fish flicking in and out of the view. Sea stars in their humped position, typical of an animal of a sea star that's feeding. You see crabs walking around in the bed. In a moment, you'll see me swimming overhead, 
pulling up a transect tape because while shooting this video, we were collecting data on the numbers of sea stars and crabs and the percent cover of mussels on the bottom. And what we know from those surveys is that a number of animals were attracted to these beds because they provided such important habitat and food resources. Okay. Shortly after, oh sorry, I'll just, and this is just a close-up view of these mussel beds to remind us of how important they are as a habitat. So you see small animals such as small clams and shrimp that live among the mussels. And it's also important to remember that these mussels provide food for larger animals as well. So <clears throat> shortly after that video and those pictures were shot, there was periods of severe hypoxia. The oxygen levels in Narragansett Bay dropped. And this graph is showing what uh, the data looked like from uh, Narragansett Bay. This is data that was collected with one of those uh, gray cylindrical instruments that I showed you just a moment ago. And there's two lines on this graph. There's the light gray or kind of bluish line that shows normal conditions at a site that was not affected by hypoxia. You see that the dissolved oxygen levels remained relatively high throughout the summer. And then at a site that was uh, affected by low dissolved oxygen, you see that the levels dropped into that red zone or hypoxic zone on two occasions. And that data was collected, or sorry, those data were collected um, right offshore from where that muscle bed was that I uh, showed a moment ago. Um, that I mentioned that the intertidal bed was the tip of the iceberg. So just offshore, the oxygen levels dropped. And um, on this slide, you're seeing a map of the extent of the low oxygen conditions. So again, we're looking at a map of the bay. The dark green is the land, and that uh, those um, areas of color, the reds and oranges, are the areas of the bay where the oxygen levels dropped to um, relatively severe hypoxic conditions. And the green and blue are where they remained um, um, not as severe. Um, Andrew, we have okay. a couple of questions sure. that have, have come in um, a little earlier. One, one just quick note to clarify. We had one person asking, could, could you say a little bit more about what, what turbidity means? Turbidity is the cloudiness of the water. So if the, the more turbid the water, the cloudier it would appear. It would be difficult to see through it. Great. Yeah. And uh, here's an interesting question that comes in from John in California who says, um, Several California state agencies are studying and bringing about changes to the copper content of the car brake shoes and pads due to the, to the fine copper dust that gets into waterways and then ends up in the San Joaquin Delta, causing problems with marine life. Has any of your work dealt with copper issues, or do you only deal with organic matter? My research is, has typically examined the consequences of, of organic matter and the effects that it has, and nutrients when they inter are introduced into um, coastal waterways. Um, copper, um, I would think, has some uh, toxic um, properties that could be very damaging to aquatic life. Copper is one of the elements that's sometimes included in anti-fouling paint that's painted on the bottoms of ship holes to prevent marine life from settling. So it would have very negative consequences of its own mm -hmm. um, that could compound some of the effects that I'm talking about today. And in fact, yeah. the, the work and the way you describe how you study it is um, one example of how putting, uh, adding uh, materials into our water can have, and you're following that chain through for us. Copper could be another example, and there might very well be people studying that, and if not, there should be. It, um, That's right. Um, yeah. Copper would enter the waterways in the same ways that the excess nutrients do. So the copper, if it's contained in, in, in brake shoes and pads, would, um, would uh, a flake off, be dropped on roadways, and when it rains, it would be washed into, uh, into the sewer system, and oftentimes that water goes directly into rivers and bays and estuaries. And so, yeah, it's following the same pathway. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, what you see now is on the slide is, uh, is just a picture of one of these muscle beds uh, before um, the hypoxic event. So it's just a reminder of um, how vast um, and dense these muscle beds were. And now there's a picture of, of just a few weeks later, the same muscle bed after the hypoxic event occurred. So you see that the muscles have, um, have died, They're, the shells are in disarray, um, and um, the bed has essentially um, 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 lost its function. And, 
and, you know, soon enough, those shells will be just sort of ground down by waves or swept ashore um, um, as just a, a, a small signature of what's happened um, below the water's surface. And of course, without the live mussels there, we've lost the filtration function, the food availability that they offered, and the habitat that they provided. And so, um, you know, these mussels are, um, you know, they're essentially the canary in the coal mine. They were the first biological evidence in the bay of just how severe a problem this estuary had um, uh, with dissolved oxygen as a, as a product of excess nutrients entering into the, into the waterway. Um, and I was able to quantify the loss of these of these muscle beds and found that um, at some of these beds, one bed was um, was uh, lost entirely. All the muscles died in one of the muscle reefs that I that I was examining, and in many of the others, over ninety percent of the muscles uh, were lost as well. So this would appear to be a very degraded estuary. Um, and now I'm going to um, describe for you something of a paradox, at least an interesting question about. Um, how sometimes the, um, the story can be a bit more complex and somewhat deceiving. So um, that's just a reminder that there's a lot of marine life that died. Um, again, um, I want to just emphasize that um, there, over the subsequent years from my muscle study, there became ev additional evidence that um, this was a very degraded system. Mussels were not the only species that were affected. Um, other species of bivalves, clams, um, and fish were affected as well. Um, and now um, I want to just turn our attention to the quahog, which is a species of clam that's found um, in Narragansett Bay. So this is, again, this is the same estuary that's affected by hypoxia, where all those mussels died. Um, and Narragansett Bay now is really known um, for the quahog. So it's a species of clam that oftentimes turns up um, um, in grocery stores, at fish markets, and on the dinner plate because it's a very valuable um, food resource. It contributes hundreds of millions of dollars to the Rhode Island economy. In fact, Little Rhode Island um, produces um, nearly a third of the nation's uh, clam supply, even though it's a tiny little state. Um, it's incredibly productive in terms of these clams. And that clam has, has attained iconic status. So I think many of us are familiar with The Family Guy. The popular TV show is set in the fictional town of Quahog, um, named after um, this iconic uh, clam that's um, so abundant in uh, Narragansett Bay. Here's some more evidence of sort of this iconic status that it has. Uh, the Quahog Festival that celebrates Quahogs. It's held every year um, as, a, as a fundraiser. It's the state shellfish um, for Rhode Island. And if you go along the shoreline, you see lots of boats, these uh, single-person skiffs that go out to either rake or dive for, for Quahogs. And there's been books written about it as well. So. Of course, the question, this is the paradox, is how has this degraded estuary that I just described has been devoid of um, some of the major habitat forming species, how is it sustaining this major fishery? How is the clam um, able to persist in this very degraded habitat? And there's, um, there's two aspects um, to the answer uh, to this question. Um, and the first is that the hypoxia tolerance, or the tolerance for low oxygen conditions varies among species in the system. So I've conducted laboratory studies to look at the tolerance for low oxygen conditions among mussels, soft shell clams, or also soft shell clams are also known as steamers when you pick them up at the grocery store, and the quahog clam. And it turns out that mussels are very susceptible to low oxygen conditions. They can only last for a day or two. The quahogs, on the other hand, can last a couple of weeks in low oxygen conditions. So when I've quantified um, the tolerance of these species to low oxygen conditions. Here's what, uh, here's what the, uh, the data look like. You see um, that the percent survivorship over, over time um, is very low. Uh, for mussels, after just two days, you have less than 50% of the laboratory population persisting, whereas for quahogs, they last well over um, two weeks. OK. So that's, that's part of the answer. And it turns out there's a little bit more to it. Because the quahogs, um, again, this is this valuable uh, fishery species, are able to tolerate low oxygen conditions. They're able to persist in these low oxygen areas. The other half of the story is that their predators are very intolerant. So predatory species such as blue crabs, sea stars, uh, fish, and uh, large whelks or snails um, have a relatively low tolerance for low oxygen conditions. And so they either die or they flee. Uh, 
those areas that are lacking oxygen. And so as a consequence, the quahogs have a refuge in those areas. Because they're able to persist and stay in those areas, um, they um, have less uh, um, predation than if they were in an area that did not have um, hypoxia. So here's an example of a species that's actually benefiting from low oxygen conditions because its predators have had to leave the area. Mm -hmm. If you go to parts of the bay near the, uh, the um, open ocean where there's oxygenated water coming into the bay, you find that um, there's actually fewer quahogs in those areas. And that's likely because their predators have access to those clam populations um, year round. It's one of those examples of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, perhaps. For, exactly for right. That's right. Yep. Um, we had a number of so. uh, questions that have come in. Uh, one in particular um, has come up a couple of times. Uh, Fiona asked it uh, this way. Um, Fiona's in, in uh, Lake Bluff, Illinois. Is there a man-made way to reverse hypoxia? Yep. The most straightforward way, although not, not necessarily an easy way to reverse hypoxia, is to cut off the nutrient supply that we're introducing into these waterways. And so there's been an effort to do so um, through managing um, agricultural practices, um, um, particularly along the southeastern and, and Gulf Coast of the US. Um, another way is to, um, to remove nutrients at sewage treatment plants. And for example, in Narragansett Bay where I've been working, there's been some efforts to do so at the major municipal sewage treatment plants, remove nutrients. Now those um, procedures aren't 100% effective, but they offer reductions. Um, um, there's also a direct way of reducing um, hypoxia, con hypoxic conditions, that is to actually bubble or diffuse oxygen gas into the bottom waters, but that's very uh, labor and money intensive, and it has an effect over a very small area. So I would suggest that that's not really a practical solution. Um, or long-term solution, um, but it's been done. And so really what this requires is um, for um, people of a relatively large geographic area to work together um, on the solution. I think we're beginning to understand um, what's required, and now it's just organizing um, everyone involved and everyone who has something at stake. So sometimes the, the simplest answer is just to stop the root cause of the issue, um, much like we wouldn't necessarily address melting ice caps by bringing the machines we use to put snow on ski slopes to try to fix it. Um, it sounds like you're, you're saying, we know what's causing it, let's address that. To a large degree, that's right, yeah. I mean, there's not, there's the, yeah, with, you know, bubbling oxygen to the bottom water would be putting a Band-Aid over the problem. It would not, it would not be a practical solution. And I think really it's in everyone's interest to work on this, on the solution to this problem, because if there's excess nutrients leaving a farmer's field and entering into the Mississippi Riverway and entering into the Gulf of Mexico, then um, you know, that means that farmer's spending more money than, than he or she needs to on fertilizer. So it's in their interest as well to reduce the amount of nutrients that there are, are um, um, being introduced into the land and, and ultimately leaving it. So there needs to be some effort to recapture, just reduce the amount that's being introduced. So I think that this is a solution that many people will benefit from once, um, once we find a way um, to do so. And um, that's also just a great time just to point out that, you know, this hypoxia is a big problem. There's a number of people who are working on this, um, this problem um, around the world. And a couple of the examples that I've described, such as in the Gulf of Mexico, Nancy Rabelais, Rabelais has been doing a lot of that work. And there's also other scientists at the Smithsonian who are tackling um, hypoxia um, and its related problems in the neighborhood. So uh, Denise uh, Breitberg, for example, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewood, Maryland, um, is, uh, is also um, um, thinking about how to tackle these problems um, where she works. Uh, All right. by, by the way, one quick mm -hmm. question. Um, Sylvia in Sun City, Arizona asked, is hypoxia the same thing that's killing the coral reefs? That's something I was going to uh, bring up a bit later, but I can um, talk about it now. So um, coral reefs are very susceptible to low oxygen conditions. In many parts of the world where uh, scientists and other interested um, people have examined the causes of decline in coral reefs, oftentimes what they focused on is um, um, uh, a decline in the herbivores um, and, and an overall um, modification of the food web. Um, that allows um, algae to proliferate. They've also looked at the effects of increasing thermal stress or increasing temperatures and how that 
leads to uh, bleaching, coral mortality directly, and also um, to disease. And they've also looked at the effects of sedimentation and other forms of uh, degradation associated with um, local and human impacts, such as um, destructive fishing practices. So what's becoming evident is that, um, again, uh, coral reefs are susceptible to hypoxia. And uh, uh, what's uh, become apparent is that in Bocas del Toro, which is uh, here in Panama on the Caribbean coast, um, in Bahia Almorante, which is a semi-enclosed um, body of water, so it's essentially an estuary um, uh, that includes a number of, of coral reef um, habitats, that um, just a year and a half ago, that um, extensive areas of the reef uh, died. And um, the jury's still out on the relative importance of contributing factors there, but it looks like dissolved oxygen, or the lack thereof, was a contributing factor, and, and perhaps the primary cause of that coral mortality. So that's actually an area of, of active interest um, for my research program. I've studied hypoxia in temperate estuaries, and I'm really interested in examining um, dead zones in, um, in coral reefs and other tropical habitats. That's really the next frontier. As I mentioned before, a lot of what we know about um, hypoxia and dead zones is from temperate areas. That's mainly because uh, that's where scientists who examine dead zones have, have really focused their efforts. And I think when we turn our attention to tropics, we'll find that there's a lot of areas that are being impacted as well. Great. So um, that's a great question. That's, that's the basis for um, a, a career. Absolutely. And that's where I'll be turning my attention next. <laughs> um, and um, I'll return for just a moment to think about um, some of the long-term change that's associated with hypoxia. So as I mentioned before, sometimes we take for granted the state of, uh, of, of a coastal ecosystem, assuming that the, that the species that we see there or don't see there um, now um, are really representative of that system through time. And so uh, what I have um, on the slide now is just is a timeline that shows several species of bivalves um, and their periods of, of um, peak harvest starting in the 1860s through present day. And what you see is that the solid bar is the period of peak harvest and the, and the dashed line is, is just the times when their harvests were either ramping up because the markets were developing or they were tapering off because their populations were in decline. And what you see is that in modern times, the quahog is king. Quahog is the species that's uh, primarily being harvested and is the basis for fisheries in Narragansett Bay. But if we look back in time, we see that actually oysters at one time were the, the, the dominant species being harvested. Scallops in parts of the bay were also very important, sustaining uh, major fisheries as well. And so it's really um, um, only in the past few decades that the quahog fishery has developed. Um, this era of the quahog has really been swept in by um, hypoxic conditions that have really become more dominant in the past um, 20, 30 years. And um, I just want to point out that the designation of the quahog as a state shellfish, that only occurred in 1987. So really um, what we've seen is that there's been a major change in the estuary. We've lost some very important species, species such as the scallop and oysters that are actually preferred to quahogs. And the success of the quahog is really masking the overall degradation of the system. So someone who just walked into Rhode Island today, saw a successful fishery, might think that the bay is perfectly healthy. But when we think about the changes that have happened through time over just the past 100 years or so, we see that actually the bay has become degraded and it's changed dramatically. And the other important thing to note here is that if something were to happen to the quahog, if we exceeded its tolerances or something, some other factor came in and wiped it out, that, um, that the um, fisheries for shellfish in Narragansett Bay would be in very serious trouble. There isn't um, at this stage, or at this point in time, another species to turn to. So that represents a very um, precarious um, position for um, uh, people involved with um, fisheries and making a living from, from the bay and the system. All right. So of course, um, much of what I've talked about today is really focused on Narragansett Bay, which again has been a great living laboratory for understanding the consequences of hypoxia. But the question is, how is this relevant elsewhere in the world? So when we take a look at um, Tokyo Bay in Japan and surrounding waters um, halfway around the world, what we see is that what, I've, you know, what I observed in Narragansett Bay predicts very well what's occurring um, in Japan. And that system 
Um, the same species of, of clam, the quahog, mercenary mercenary, is an invasive species, incidentally induced, pro introduced probably by the, the famous uh, Tokyo fish market. And when you go into Tokyo Bay, which is a, you know, a very urban and very degraded estuary, as many um, coastal areas near urban centers are, um, in Tokyo Bay, um, the bottom waters are hypoxic. Not surprisingly, given that there's a large um, human population right on the coast. And if you uh, were to dive down or to drag a rake through those bottom waters that are very hypoxic, what you find is that the only sp species of clam that's persisting there is this introduced quahog clam. And it's now sparked a fishery in Japan for this, uh, for this uh, uh, eastern Atlantic uh, species. Um, and there you see on the slide is a picture of the quahog clam uh, you know, wrapped in cellophane from a, from a Japanese uh, market. And this is, uh, incidentally, I just want to point out that uh, this is actually work that's um, been conducted by uh, Toshio Furota. He's a, a colleague of mine um, at a university there in Japan. He's the one that's gone out and quantified the importance of this quahog to the local fishery and its, its uh, prominence in the hypoxic waters. So that's a very um, direct prediction of um, uh, some of what I've observed. Um, um, uh, born out halfway around the world. And of course, moving outside of temperate estuaries, this gets to the question that we raised earlier about the importance of hypoxia um, in other estuaries, particularly in tropical areas. And we see that hypoxia uh, uh, has apparently played an important role in mortality of coral reefs and uh, coral reef organisms in Bocas del Toro. So here's a picture that was taken in the year 2010 um, in the fall. So this is about a, a year and a half ago. And what you see is a, a vase sponge where um, the bottom half of the, um, of the sponge is dead and it's being just um, consumed by some um, uh, um, bacteria that are typical of um, hypoxic conditions. And this picture is just really representative of a large-scale mortality event um, that killed off many of the coral living um, below about um, 30 feet of water or about 10 meters. Um, and so this, I think, caught a lot of scientists by surprise because we don't typically associate hypoxic conditions or dead zones with the tropics and because scientists have been working in this area and hadn't seen an event like this before. And the fact that some long-lived corals died in the event suggests that it hadn't happened um, recently before this event. Um, but times are changing and it could be attributable to increasing population in Bocas del Toro in that province and along the shorelines of Bija Marante. Um, it could also be related to some large-scale um, climate change that's um, affecting the oceanography in the area as well, perhaps. So that's something that um, I um, will be um, looking at um, over the next few years is thinking about what drives hypoxic events in a system like Bocas del Toro and what the consequences are um, for the living system. So. It's amazing. We talk about places. You talk about your work in New England and uh, your, the work that you'll, you're doing and will be doing here. Um, cities and places have borders, but, but science is science no matter where you are and the kinds of things that can affect water quality and water and, and, and uh, wildlife um, are, are common from place to place. That's right. Um, and so it's very uh, it's important for us to remember that what happens in one place can happen elsewhere in very very uh, well may be happening elsewhere. That's um, right. In fact, I wanted to use this opportunity to greet some folks who are logged in. Uh, we just had a group a few minutes ago who joined uh, in the middle of your talk from uh, Kenya, a group of uh, 15 to 18 year old uh, girls at the uh, uh, Kisumu Girls High School. And we want to welcome all of them. And uh, we're recording our session today, so you'll be able to go back and, and pick up the beginning of the story about hypoxia, so we we're thank you thank you for joining us. We have just a few minutes left, and I wanted to sneak in a couple of questions and also give you a chance to close up some some loose ends uh, as well. One question that um, came in a little while ago um, was, uh, do you see, foresee a, a day when the muscle in the estuary will replace the canary in the coal mine in everyday speech? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hope not. I mean, I hope that you know we see muscle beds and reefs thriving in estuaries such as Narragansett Bay, that we see return of those other bivalves um, such as scallops and oysters that were once there. So I hope that that analogy won't take hold and that it won't be necessary because I hope that these coastal um, bays and estuaries will um, sort of return to their previous 
you know, previously majestic state. And that um, if someone were to refer to muscles um, in, in the estuary, that it'll be um, a, an analogy for a, a, an upward trajectory or, or return to good times. So uh, I think, um, you know, only time will tell um, how we think of muscles in, in, the, in a bay such as Narragansett Bay and whether it becomes a relic of the past and, 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 a, and a kind of a um, pessimistic analogy or whether it can be um, sort of a, um, a beacon of um, when things reached their, their worst and, and um, started a trajectory of improvement. I like the way you think. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an important message for all of us in, who are taking, place in the, taking part in the, the Shout online conference. We're exploring and we're trying to discover what's going on, but we're thinking about how we can act. Um, and so we don't have to settle for a, a metaphor that has a, a negative connotation. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to sneak in. It's such a great place to end, but I, there are a couple more questions. I'm going to sneak them in. Is that sure, all right? Sure, I'd love to. Um, are there any species that are benefiting from hypoxia in Panama, much as the, the uh, uh, quahogs are in New England, or, or any other species that are coming in to replace the mussels? Uh, that's a great question. So from what I've seen um, from having dived on these uh, reefs out in Bocas del Toro that were affected by low oxygen conditions, um, there isn't an obvious species that's uh, benefiting um, from, you know, this mortality event. Um, but I think that there are some species that might be able to persist through mild hypoxic conditions. And there's also some species that may predictably recolonize first. And so in that, in that case, um, there may be some species that um, benefit indirectly and in that they're the sort of weedy species that show up first, occupy the vacant real estate, that's been vacated by species that might otherwise hold them at bay. So that's a question that I hope to answer with my research over the, you know, the next um, year or two, is to think about what species might be there after one of these um, largely negative events. I mean, I think, too, something to keep in mind is that oftentimes that it, what escapes the naked eye is that there's um, you know, active microbial life in these areas. Um, some of those same species that drive hypoxic conditions um, um, there could be the same or other microbial species that are actually benefiting from them. And so the surfaces of the dead corals could be covered with, um, with microbes or with other um, algae that quickly colonize um, these areas. And so that's something that um, needs to be quantified. Yeah. Well, as you begin to quantify it and do your work over the next year or two, I hope we'll be able to check in with you again and uh, get an update. Uh, we'd love to have you rejoin us. Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to share what I find. Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Andrew Altieri for uh, coming down to uh, Barro Colorado Island to, to be with us today and for sharing the incredible work that he's doing and, and uh, issuing uh, some, some really good ways that we can think about the impact that we have on our water and how we can reverse that impact as well. So thank you all for your great questions. Um, we'll be back in um, just about, just under 10 minutes, uh, right at the top of the next hour, where we'll be joined uh, by Sharon Ryan, uh, Dr. Anthony Coates, uh, and also um, Dave Pearson, who will be logging in, actually already is logged in uh, remotely, uh, joining us in Arizona. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be back for Desert to Rainforest in just about eight minutes. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>